All right, greetings everyone from uh, Newark, Delaware. I'm Salim Ali. I'm a professor in the College of Earth, Ocean and Environment, as well as the Biden School of Public Policy at the University of Delaware. And I'm joined with uh, four wonderful colleagues who will be presenting uh, their ideas of what has been done innovatively in Delaware and also perhaps some areas of improvement. Now, in terms of the way we're going to handle things, uh, I'd urge you to please keep yourself muted uh, and also to keep your videos off to make sure we keep our bandwidth connections until you're ready to speak and ask questions. Uh, I'm also going to request you to use the chat feature generously because we'll be able to also keep a record of the conversations even if we don't have time to ask a question uh, in real time, you will be able to have that recorded in the chat feature. All right, so with that, I'm going to introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Joseph Nyangon, who is going to present some of his work uh, based on his doctoral research as well as further work that he has done. He did his PhD at the University of Delaware and uh, he is um, currently also a postdoctoral associate with the university as well as with the Payne Institute uh, at the Colorado School of Mines. He's also a TED fellow. Those of you who are uh, followers of the TED online videos, mm -hmm. you'll uh, note his uh, affiliation there as well. So with that, Joe, over to you. And I'm going to uh, share your PowerPoint momentarily, and you can uh, start off with there we go hopefully this will <laughs> work share screen and there we are so salem should i just click on my side uh, yeah, so I will go through because I have it saved. So I will go through. Just let me know when you want to. Uh, okay. I don't think you'll be able to because I've, I'm showing it from my screen. All right. Okay, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And for those who will be watching the webinar recording, it is an absolute pleasure to share with you Emerging Clean Energy Innovations we are working on here in Delaware. As uh, Salim has uh, said, my name is uh, Joe Nyangon and I work here at the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy uh, on a project funded by the U.S. Department of Energy National Science Foundation uh, grant and uh, the Delaware General Assembly. In this project, we are collaborating with a number of universities, including Arizona State University, uh, MIT, and the University of California, Merced. As the title of my presentation suggests, uh, solar energy has emerged as a catalyst for meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement uh, and the United Nations 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, because solar is a very modular technology, it is helping clean energy innovations get to market faster and the solar city strategy that we are presenting today is disrupting existing business models for financing, procuring, and constructing sustainable energy projects in cities. As we become more reliant on the technology that interconnects us, uh, interconnects our, us to our jobs, our, to our families and our pastimes, reliable, clean, and affordable electricity allows us to maintain those constant connections while making transformative climate responsive change in our energy system. And uh, next slide. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, plenty of uh, rooftop buildings here in Delaware, uh, across the country, and indeed in other international uh, cities on which to put uh, solar panels. We have conducted research in a number of cities, including in New York, in London, in Amsterdam, uh, in South Korea, in Tokyo, Japan, uh, Philadelphia, and uh, right here in Delaware's two main cities, Wilmington and Newark. And your city could okay. be next. And even, no, sorry, yeah, okay. still on the, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, yeah, so as, uh, as our presentation shows, uh, we have also estimated the solar PV potential 
of the city of, uh, of Seoul, as I was explaining earlier. And we have found that uh, Seoul in South Korea has got sufficient uh, power to actually cover its entire load uh, during favorable moments when its solar energy city fabric can be exploited. And second, Diverse policy efforts, notably state renewable portfolio standards and net metering policy, have also incentivized rooftop solar, as we had from the introduction from the introductory video. And this has accelerated its growth in cities. In Delaware, for example, there are favorable energy policies in place, as well as other proposed legislations to support development of uh, solar energy. For example, in Delaware, Delaware was one of the uh, early states uh, to uh, adopt net metering, net metering policies, which has, which has been in place since 1999. Net metering policy allows solar developers to get full credit on their electric bill for the power they produce. As a result, in 2013, Delaware ranked seventh nationally on per capita level for rapid cumulative solar capacity. And third, as we have from the introductory video, an important driver to the growth of solar in most states is a rapid decline in solar cost. This falling cost profile has significantly improved the economics of rooftop solar electricity, thereby making the investment case for widespread solar energy deployment attractive to investors, particularly when a utility scale is considered. I, in our analysis of uh, uh, financial feasibility of citywide uh, solar PV deployment, we have found that most cities could deploy the solar city strategy under both existing conditions, as well as considering other risk profiles. For instance, we have found that an average city has adequate rooftop capacity to supply nearly 30% of its annual electricity load. Now, Next, let's look at the solar city model strategy. In brief, our research has been guided by the following question. How much rooftop space is available for solar PV and how much electrical energy is generated by that rooftop area? And to answer this question, we have adopted an analytical approach that estimates the technical and economic potential of rooftop solar for the selected building. Assessing the technical potential of a city to deploy rooftop solar requires a series of datasets that together provide insights into the city's morphological and meteorological conditions. For instance, upon selecting a rooftop area, we use LIDAR, light detection and ranging data for geographical information system rendering. We then determine the influence of shading to understand how shading affects the solar energy yield on the city's rooftops. Rooftops with insufficient yield are subsequently excluded from our analysis, and we also account for shading aspect and slope. Uh, and the result is the estimated technical potential of that building. And next, we run an estimated technical potential that we have established into an NREL system advisor model to calculate break even solar power purchase price. And this gives us the estimated economic potential. Now, next, let's look at two practical applications, beginning with a project in Pennsylvania State. In Philadelphia, we have estimated a technical potential of 82 megawatts for city-owned buildings, after out of which 50 megawatts account for flat rooftops. We estimate the cost of solar PV investment for city-owned buildings to be about $78 million, uh, while that for flat rooftops is about $48 million. But this is only accounting for public-owned buildings. Our estimated citywide assessment for solar technical potential in Philadelphia yields about 4.7 gigawatts. Now this is huge and could bring some significant positive benefits, not just to Philadelphia, but also to its environs. Second, next, we have applied the same assessment in Delaware. Our analytical method has identified about 10,800 buildings 
with a total rooftop area of about 43 million square footage of suitable space across the entire city of Wilmington. Now, separated by property class, this available uh, rooftop area amounts to about 90 megawatts for residential buildings, 75 megawatts for, public, uh, for both public and uh, commercial buildings, and 20 megawatts for uh, industrial buildings. The total citywide uh, rooftop PV technical potential of suitability after accounting for suitability assessment for Wilmington is about 260 megawatts. On the other hand, for Newark, we have identified about 8,100 buildings with a total rooftop area of about 24 million square footage uh, of suitable space. When we separate this by property class, this available rooftop area amounts to about 65 megawatts for residential buildings, uh, 48 megawatts for public buildings and uh, 32 megawatts for commercial buildings. And the estimated citywide rooftop PV technical potential for Newark is about 169 megawatts. Now using Delaware's sustainable energy utility SEU and each of the city's uh, planning departments uh, to, de to design and manage the project with the uh, Delaware SEU financing, the solar city investment for all the buildings would be about 160 million uh, dollars for Newark City and about $250 million for Wilmington City with a power purchase price of about, uh, uh, power purchase price paid uh, by citizens and businesses of about 9.7 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, compared to the current average electricity price in, uh, for both cities, which is about 12 cents per kilowatt hour, there's significant benefits as well, as, as well there that we have established. Uh, next. Now, another project in the solar city, solar cities domain we are currently developing here in Delaware involves the use of community solar. Community solar refers to a form of distributed uh, solar generation facility that's located within close proximity to electricity users. Our research has investigated uh, 14 states, including six leaders of community solar de uh, development, that is California, Massachusetts, uh, Maryland, Minnesota, New Jersey, and New York. Community solar policies include uh, LMI uh, requirements, which uh, seek to encourage participation of low income consumers. We have also uh, considered other elements of community solar, which are important in this regard. And these include program structure, uh, individual project sizes, uh, subscriber location, subscriber eligibility, the value of the community solar to uh, pro project uh, users, as well as uh, payment uh, requirements. Now, in Delaware, the state has proposed to increase the renewable portfolio standard to 40% from renewable energy by the year 2030, and also to create community sustainable energy authorities for each city, town, and county, where basically uh, to define and govern community solar deployment with investment facilitated by the Delaware uh, SEU or local government financing authorities. Uh, the Delaware S S S S SEU was uh, created by uh, Dr. Ban, uh, our next speaker, and uh, Senator Harris McDowell, who represents the first district here in Delaware. And it represents an attempt to meet aggressive and transformative goal for sustainable energy future in Delaware. The principal difference between the Delaware's SEU and a public benefit fund, for instance, is that an SEU accrues revenue through shared energy savings. An SEU also functions as a community utility, uh, which, directs, uh, which is directly accountable to the local community because the projects are close, uh, situated closely to consumers. And it, serves, uh, uh, and it serves as it seeks to deliver uh, sustainable energy uh, services. One of the achievements of the Delaware SEU, uh, just to highlight, has been catapulting Delaware into a top 10 ranked state nationally on a per capita level for rapid cumulative solar installation. This is very important uh, to the future of energy sustainability as we had in the introductory video and also to our climate goals as, we, as you will hear from uh, uh, Dr. Ban, our next speaker. And to conclude next, as we have documented in our research publications, cities have the potential to embark on a vigorous sustainable energy pathway 
that exceeds their current obligations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyongon, for that very informative presentation. Uh, we will move on directly to our next speaker who has been uh, partially introduced and many of you, of course, will know Professor uh, John Byrne, who is the founder of the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy at the University of Delaware, as well as the founder of the Energy and Environmental Policy Graduate Program that was uh, the, one of the first on the East Coast in the US uh, uh, in terms of uh, graduate education in this area. Uh, Dr. Byrne is a distinguished professor within the Biden School of Public Policy. And uh, as uh, noted, he has worked uh, for many years uh, with the state of Delaware in improving energy performance. Uh, he's also an alumnus of the University of Delaware at multiple levels. So thank you very much, Dr. Byrne, for joining. So. Uh, I'm going to uh, let you start off with sharing your screen because you have your PowerPoint uh, on your screen and you're good to go. Thanks very much, uh, Salim, and thank you, Joe, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us. I think it's a uh, special time for us to discuss uh, fundamental problems like this, uh, living in this uh, era of uh, a virus and uh, that's very uh, threatening to us. Uh, as even the, uh, from Bar uh, Bard College mentioned, uh, climate, uh, the climate crisis we face uh, happens in a way that is more insidious and maybe uh, not as well recognized uh, every day as what we are unfortunately experiencing uh, with the coronavirus. But uh, the need to climb down from an extraordinarily high level of carbon emissions by the uh, human population and to do that uh, quickly in order to make life uh, livable, uh, both for us in the near term and in the long term, uh, is essential. So um, I've worked a long time in this field and I just wanted to uh, uh, briefly in the spirit of the, of the webinar's uh, effort to combine sustainability and justice issues, I simply wanted to uh, complement what, uh, what Joe has said by giving you a few remarks on um, the justice side of this. And I think that's important because uh, it has been a problem for us. We negotiated for nearly 20 years at the global level and could not get significant movement on the sustainability question. And many uh, who went through that experience believe that uh, a key reason for that is the failure to put in another core value in the definition of the pathway uh, for uh, our future. And that, 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 that missing value is climate justice. And it's something that's found uh, readily. You can see it in our state of Delaware. Uh, if you just compare uh, the first quintile and what it pays for basic electricity use uh, against uh, the fifth quintile, you can see readily you're, you have an inequality of roughly an order of 14 in magnitude as uh, low-income uh, families have to make uh, difficult choices between the basic electricity service. This is not, uh, this is not a large consumption. This is uh, just what is thought to be the basic uh, requirements uh, in a household uh, in the modern era. And so um, that difficulty actually embeds poverty in um, these communities because they're, without that electrical service, a lot of other opportunities are not available. And uh, it's something that uh, we live with every day. The modern income families are not always facing the poverty directly that uh, in the second uh, quintile that the first do, but still uh, it's a major risk and uh, difficult choices must be made uh, in order just to conduct uh, daily life while um, other quintiles do not face this. So we live with this kind of insidious embedded uh, injustice in our, our community. Uh, we have roughly 100,000 uh, households out of the 370,000 in the state uh, that face this, uh, this uh, problem. And of course, this is not a problem. You can find it in every state. 
And because of uh, its origins in the transformation of the atmosphere, you can find it uh, everywhere in the world. And one of the practical um, um, implications of that is that we have created a world of, um, of, of carbon excess uh, provided by the wealthiest countries in the world. Our uh, planet came with the ability to absorb about 3.3 tons per person per year uh, at 1990 populations. Uh, this graph shows you where we are against that metric, and the width of these show you the proportion of the world's population that are in those individual countries. And as you can see, um, the uh, greatest part of this problem comes from the wealthy world, um, and often the brunt of the uh, disaster that comes with climate change is borne by um, the, uh, the rest of the world that has little uh, to do with the uh, causes of the of this problem. So we have this problem. It is uh, a basic injustice that we have to cure. I think after the experience of 20 years of negotiation at the international level, uh, that without adding climate justice in, you're not going to get uh, an all-in uh, uh, opportunity. But I think also, and why I think even in, in Bard College have, uh, have been very thoughtful in their development of this webinar, much of that momentum to make that happen is not going to happen in the negotiators at the international uh, meetings. Much of that momentum is actually in the communities themselves. Um, I can't spend time here, unfortunately, uh, showing you, but if you look at the, uh, the, um, both the targets and the achievements of our local communities, our cities, our towns, our counties, our states, they almost always in the US and around the world beat uh, what is the national policy or the national um, uh, strategy in this regard. It's much more likely that we're going to get significant movement and transformation if local uh, communities take on uh, this challenge. So far they are trying and uh, one of the challenges that is very important in those communities when you listen to those uh, those discussions and those narratives is to solve the problem of justice with uh, the problem of sustainability. So in that uh, spirit, I just want to give you a sense of where the problem exists and why uh, the IPCC is indicating, a body that I've worked with for a long time, why it is indicating that we need to make transformative change and not incremental change. Um, this is a busy graph. I'm not expecting you to uh, uh, understand all of it necessarily, but here is, let me try and summarize the point. It's uh, the work of my colleague, Juhi Lee, uh, who looked at the problem that South Korea faced by going with the sort of traditional modern energy system solution to a problem. In this case, to use nuclear power in the premise that somehow it would reduce carbon uh, emissions. But in so doing, it has now embedded a deep social injustice in the society. Uh, the lower graph shows you the counties that are the relatively uh, moderate and low-income counties gathered along the left uh, bottom part of the graph, and the counties that are well-to-do and do most of the electricity consumption are in that flat line at the top. There is just two distinct communities in uh, Korea this way. And if you do the more generic uh, problem of uh, development and, um, and uh, the way the energy system is devised, again, you can see most of the burden and the risk, who is approximate to those plants, who will uh, suffer from the uh, accidents, and who, even if there are no accidents, will suffer from uh, the suppressed uh, economic possibilities because of these plants. This is part of what is the the deeper injustice that is built into the existing system. Compensation cannot solve this problem. There is really only one way to solve this problem, and that is to move rapidly away from it and to move toward the kind of uh, uh, suggestions that Joe made, and I'm sure Christina and my colleagues, uh, uh, Phil, will make uh, uh, in just a moment. Um, on that uh, note, can we uh, get there? Is there a way to uh, make this all work? Uh, this is briefly a uh, indication of what those communities that I mentioned have done uh, compared to national efforts. The national efforts list the major national 
uh, carbon reduction bills introduced in the U.S. Uh, since uh, 2002 um, or 2001, and uh, against those, uh, none of which were passed, uh, against those are the steady progress that the lo local governments and local communities have made, creating net metering so that what you pay for electricity is what you receive if you inject clean, renewable energy uh, into the grid. Uh, and a critical uh, early uh, tool created by our states and cities, not by the federal government in the U.S. case. Similarly, the RPS setting not simply uh, goals and standards, but also obliging the utility sector to invest in these new technologies. Currently uh, in Delaware, about three and a half to four and a half million dollars are invested each year in uh, uh, wind technologies and another uh, five to seven million dollars are invested through the RPS uh, in uh, the development of solar technologies. Um, we also have an energy efficiency resource standard, which requires the utilities to actually reduce consumption over time, not increase, not slow down the rate of increase, but to actually decrease the volume of electricity use by making uh, our services what we want rather than simply uh, selling us uh, electricity. And when you look at that picture, uh, I just offer that this is the opportunity. These are the, the uh, drivers in a society like the U.S. Uh, Delaware, I'm pleased to say, has every single one of these uh, major policy options, including uh, green financing, which Joe mentioned uh, through the SEU. And I think with the development of a community solar program that is being actively discussed uh, in the Senate uh, under the leadership of Senator Harris McDowell, I think there is the possibility for us to move even faster than uh, what we have in the past. We will have to, and I think it is possible because communities at the end of the day have solved the question of how to build interest and how to build momentum in going forward. I just hope, and I know in the case of the community solar efforts that are going on now, I just hope that we take what the UN motto gave us uh, for this regard, which is, build this new future with sustainability for all. We didn't do at all well in the previous round of building an energy system. We must do better, not only in terms of sustainability, but in terms of climate justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, JB, for that um, great uh, encapsulation of climate justice, both uh, within Delaware as well as across the miles in uh, South Korea. Uh, I, I would alert you to a few questions which are coming up in the chat room. So both Joe and yourself may want to address those in the chat room. Uh, and uh, you may want to mute yourself while you do that. So the clicking of your keyboard does not uh, uh, come into the audio. Uh, wonderful. So moving on now from solar and climate justice, we move to wind and we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Christina Archer, uh, who is a professor in the College of Earth, Ocean and Environment. And she is um, also um, had an affiliation in engineering. She's a, in, trained as an engineer, uh, did her doctorate at Stanford, uh, and then um, joined uh, UD uh, many years ago. So she is very much a, a Delawarean. Uh, and uh, she's also originally from Italy, uh, and uh, can you know perhaps also bring into the conversation some uh, aspects of um, comparisons uh, which may be appropriate or that may come up in uh, uh, the subsequent conversations in the chat room. So I'm going to share her presentation. Hopefully it is visible now. So over to you, Dr. Archer. Thank you, Salim. C can you hear me? Yes. All right, and thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about my favorite things in the world. <laughs> so I will be talking about offshore wind power and a vehicle to grid, uh, acronym V2G. And you might wonder why am I talking about these two uh, things? Well, um, this is all about Delaware, uh, Delaware and climate change. And uh, our biggest threat in terms of climate change in Delaware is actually sea level rise. So we Delawareans are the second lowest, lowest line state in the country after Louisiana, so sea level rise is a serious uh, threat for us. 
And so we need to do something about it. And uh, transportation as well as electricity generation are the largest contributions to uh, CO2 emissions in, in, the, in the country actually. And so if we wanna fight climate change, it kinda makes sense to start uh, acting on these two uh, major sources. Again, electricity generation and transportation. So if you want to step away from, from fossil fuels and electricity generation, that's where wind comes in very handy. And Delaware being a coastal state, we don't have mountains, we don't have a lot of wind inland, but boy, we have a lot of offshore wind. So offshore wind is really a wonderful resource for us. And uh, when you're looking at uh, uh, emissions from transportation, Again, it's burning of diesel and, and gasoline. So if you can switch to electric vehicles and then have this wonderful V2G technique, then, uh, then you're set. Uh, so I'm gonna have a lot of you know, figures and photos in my presentation. And the next one uh, shown here is about the, the, these incredible uh, turbines that uh, uh, we're gonna have in the next few years. And they're really technological mar marvels. If you look at the picture on the upper right corner, that is the hub of the new GE Heliod X uh, turbine. This is a 12 megawatt machine. It's, it's so large. I mean, look at the comparison between all those uh, people at the bottom of just the hub to, to give you an idea of how majestic these, these turbines really are. An example of a delivery of a blade is in the picture in the uh, lower right corner. And this is going through a small French village uh, to, to, to deliver the blades to a nearby farm. And, and I, I can only imagine what would happen you know, on, a bad, on a bad turn or, or when there's a bridge. So it, the delivery of even the, the blades is actually complicated because the machines are so large. The, the figure in the center shows you some kind of a visual comparison about how tall they are. So if you stay inland, basically the, the tallest turbine that you can find is on the order of 600 feet or less from the bottom to the very tip, uh, the top of the, the, the tip when, when it's in the um, upper the vertical position. And uh, so, you know, the, the Statue of Liberty is a baby compared to, to the, the inland turbines. When you go offshore, well, everything gets even bigger. And the reason why is, is, is mainly it's so complicated to build offshore that uh, you know the bigger you can do it the better it is because you have less trips and you can extract more power from one position one turbine as opposed to having to build multiple of them so not surprisingly the largest turbines are going to be offshore um, and so the the Heliot X uh, which is a GE so it's an American turbine is going to be probably so far it's going to be the biggest 12 megawatts it's 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 really incredible amount of power. And the blades are um, over 100 meters uh, in length each. So it, it's really incredible. If we go to the next slide, um, this is, I'm gonna try to convince you about why offshore wind is so, uh, it makes so much sense for us on the East Coast. And this feed, these two figures show you uh, the distribution of wind speed on the left and capacity factor on the right uh, along the shore. And uh, the numbers, uh, they're amazing. This is an average wind speed over a year in general. And offshore of Delaware, you can see these, these red coral uh, color, which is eight meters per second or higher on average, which is really remarkable. The capacity factor, which is basically tells you out of 100%, if a turbine was, produ was producing 100% of what it can, uh, what, what does it produce actually on average? And over land, we go between you know, 20 to 30% capacity factors. But here offshore, especially offshore of Delaware, easily we can get into the 40 and 45% capacity factor. So these are really uh, very high. Um, and and the, the value of wind speed that I mentioned, eight, eight and a half meters per second, maybe you can't really grasp how much it is. But in that link that I'm showing you, the Global Wind Atlas, if you click on it, um, and uh, if you, uh, Salim, can go to the next slide, I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. Oh, you have the older version of my PowerPoint. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I, 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 you, you have to go there on your own. If you can, please go back. Yeah, sorry. Um, um, it, it would have been very nice to compare how smooth and powerful the wind is offshore 
versus how much less it is over, over, over the land. And um, over land, it's much more sensitive to mountains and things like that. But in Delaware, basically, the, 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 uh, the, off, the inland resource is, not, is nothing, nothing compared to the offshore resource. So we have high winds, high capacity factors, shallow bathymetry. I almost forgot to mention that. Uh, the continent, continental shelf is not very deep and uh, the geology is also very favorable for offshore wind. And even more important, uh, it's, it's, there is the proximity to a lot of large urban centers and big cities. So it's obviously an excellent uh, <laughs> position where we are. And not surprisingly, in the next slide, uh, you can see the uh, various leases that uh, BOEM, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, it's, a part, it's part of the US Department of the Interior. It's the uh, entity in charge of leasing out these areas for development for offshore wind. And the ones that I'm showing here on the uh, East Coast and the West Coast are the current uh, active, lease, active or planned leases that uh, are going on. And uh, uh, as you can see, hopefully, there's a couple of them that are right offshore of Delaware. Uh, Skip Jack and uh, US Wind are their names, and I'll talk about them uh, a little more uh, very soon. Um, in the US, we only have one existing uh, operational wind farm at Block Island. It's 30 megawatts, and uh, uh, it's only five turbines. Um, but there are 25 gigawatts that are planned. So 30 megawatts installed today, 25,000 planned for the next few years. So this is a booming industry. It's an incredible development, and it's very exciting to, to be here and do, uh, to do offshore, offshore wind in Delaware. Seven states are already on board from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York. I wish I could say Delaware was one of them. We are not. So that's something that we can really, uh, we should really be thinking about a little more and uh, try to have a uh, more development uh, in, in, in Delaware. But uh, um, also in terms of the developers, we now have big names coming in. Ersted, even Avangrid, uh, US Wind, uh, they're coming in with money and uh, you know, it's becoming a real serious industry. If we go to the uh, next slide, I'm going to zoom in a little bit to Delaware and, and Maryland actually, our, our neighbor. And these are the two wind lease energy areas that are relevant to us, uh, Skip Jack and uh, US Wind. Uh, they're going to happen uh, right. soon. And uh, both of them are going to be using the GE Haliad X turbine that uh, I mentioned earlier. Should I answer no, questions no. now, uh, Sorry, no, not right now. Yeah, yes, okay. please make sure everyone mutes their uh, audio while uh, 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 all right go ahead Thanks. yeah um, so when you have a uh, lease area and you build your turbines offshore the little schematic at the bottom of the slide shows you how it would work basically mm -hmm. it shows that you have to have the cable going uh, to the bottom of the ocean and connect to the grid inland so you have to build all of this as part of the, uh, the farm the wind farm um, uh, project that you're going to propose. And so connecting to the land is, is one of the issues that are interesting because of course the developers want to spend as little money as, little money as possible in doing this because this means cheaper prices for everybody. But at the same time, you know, the communities may or may not like that uh, the, the, the big uh, cables come uh, on shore in their communities. If we go to the next slide. Um, I have a couple of photos of our own uh, turbine at the University of Delaware. We are the only uh, operational turbine, large scale, large scale turbine in Delaware. And we've been operational since 2011 or 2010. And so these are some photos of, uh, you know, the foundation building and the construction phase when the hub was delivered. And this beautiful photo shows the turbine as it is, actually it was a few years ago. Um, in, in our marine campus in Lewis. And at the link that I show here, you can follow the real-time production of, of uh, wind energy from our turbine. So this is uh, very exciting. Um, I'm ready now to switch to the vehicle to grid, which is maybe something you're less familiar with. And uh, V2G is entirely the idea of uh, Dr. Willett Kempton, who's uh, one of our uh, faculty here at UD. 
And uh, the, the main reason behind V2G, which you still, I know you don't know what it is yet, it's coming. But I have to tell you that uh, the main reason, my main reason why we are interested in it is storage, storage, storage. Storage is expensive. V2G can do storage for a very, very low cost. So it, it's an incredible opportunity uh, for Delaware to, to do this. And a couple of facts to build up to V2G are that uh, uh, in the US we have a lot of cars. I looked up this value on Wikipedia a few, a few minutes ago, 275 million cars in the US. Crazy, crazy, there are a lot of cars. Uh, and actually already a million of electric vehicles, that's, that's actually kind of promising as well. And all these cars, I can promise you, 95% of the time they are sitting somewhere, either in, in your garage, either in the parking lot where you work. On average, we drive, you know, 5% of the time and park 95%. So while the vehicle is parked, and especially if it's an electric vehicle and has a battery, guess what? That battery is a micro storage unit. And if you put all of these cars together, you actually have a, a significant storage system, potential storage system in place. Why? Because the electric vehicles already have a battery. You don't have to purchase it and they already have conversion equipment on board. So it's a very cheap solution as well. And so the beauty is that uh, vehicles and cars, which are one of the main causes of uh, climate change and CO2 emissions, now becomes part of, become part of the solution as opposed to being just the problem. So let's take a look at how it works in the next slide. So the first step is that uh, you have an electric car so it has to be an electric car with a relatively large battery and you're in the red which it's not very fun when it gets red it means that you have to charge so you want to charge your car you have a vehicle to grid system on board which you still don't know exactly what it is but when you want to charge your car you can go to any charger and it works exactly as it's always worked you plug it in and energy comes electricity comes from the grid to your battery next step is that uh, now you have your full battery and it's, it's, it's ready for you to do whatever you want. And one of the things that you might wanna do in the next slide is to actually dedicate some of that charge that you have in your battery, some of it, not all of it, and you decide how much. You can let some of that charge go into the grid for two reasons. One could be to make money, literally. You sell that ele electricity back to the grid at a cost so you can make money that way. Or you can actually save costs to yourself if you go back to your home and release that electricity into your house so that you don't have to actually uh, purchase electricity later. So no, no matter what, uh, you, are, uh, you decide how much you wanna give out and with the rest, you can drive as you wanted before. And all of this in, in the future, in a very, uh, in an upcoming future, hopefully soon, will be done via an app. So, you can be on the market, decide how much you're willing to donate, not donate, to sell, and how much you want to keep for your, for your um, driving trip. So um, in the next slide, I uh, want to show you briefly why this makes so much sense. And again, storage is the reason, and storage is expensive. Um, this slide has a lot of data that I actually didn't calculate. Uh, a, a software did this, did this for my colleague, Dr. Kempton, but it shows you the capital cost that you need to invest if you want to have a battery or, or yeah, let's say a battery, a, a storage of some sort. Uh, and it, it's very expensive and obviously it's more expensive for residential and small commercial batteries and it's cheaper and cheaper as the, as the scale goes up. Uh, so on the x-axis here we have capital cost getting larger and larger and on the y-axis we have a bunch of types of batteries that you can have lithium ion uh, you know lead advanced lead whatever it is let's not worry about that but the cheapest thing you can find on this plot is basically a thousand dollars per kilowatt that's the cheapest storage that you can find and then if you're starting to do v2g in the next slide this is what the cost of v2g would be and this is just one value that I'm showing, two values actually. The red is what has already been proven in demo projects uh, on, on uh, uh, the V2G demos, uh, and it's order of $227 per kilowatt. 
And these have to do with a few minor changes that you have to do to the vehicles to, to allow for the, the electric charge to actually be released from the car to the grid, not only received, but also released. And so in demo projects, which as you can imagine are more expensive because you have a limited number of cars, because the technology is new, because you're testing, the cost is 227 and it's projected to be order of $45 per kilowatt. So again, the cheapest form of storage you can find today is order of $1,100 per kilowatt and only if you're like a large utility. So this is basically the last slide I have and uh, hopefully um, I, I can take some questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Archer. And um, also because you've covered some of the work of um, Dr. Kempton, I should acknowledge uh, him as well. Um, and I hope that uh, others who are interested in V2G uh, can connect with him. This is very much a, a Delaware um, innovation that is now being upscaled also in other parts of the world. Um, all right, so uh, as noted before, we are going to try and do the questions in the chat room. So I would urge those of you who have questions uh, for um, also for um, Dr. Archer to please type in your questions. And there's one already for you there. So um, uh, that should be great. Now we're going to move on to our final presenter, last but not least, Dr. Phil Barnes, who is. Um, uh, at, in the faculty of the Biden School of Public Policy and Administration uh, at UD. And uh, he has been uh, also working actively at many levels uh, around climate policy uh, within the state of Delaware. Uh, and uh, he uh, will tell you more about some of his work therein. But um, suffice it to say, he's a uh, uh, someone who has great knowledge of the state uh, at multiple levels. So I'm going to share his uh, presentation. And similarly, please let me know as well, Phil, when you want uh, to advance the slides. Uh, everyone can view the presentation there. There we go. Okay, thank you, Salim, uh, for organizing. Thank you, everybody, for attending this uh, Power Dialogue. Thank you to Barb uh, College for putting this on. Um, happy to talk about some of, the, some of the issues surrounding sea level rise. So Christina mentioned it at the beginning of her talk, uh, and I would agree, the biggest threat to uh, Delaware um, uh, going forward is certainly going to be sea level rise and its impact on the state. So the, the first three presentations that you've heard today all address this issue of climate um, mitigation, where we are trying to reduce our, um, our carbon emissions and decarbonize our economies. Uh, this talk will be about climate adaptation, where we essentially assume that some, um, some impact from climate change is um, unavoidable and we have to deal with that in the way that is, uh, is most appropriate. So uh, right now, um, as also as Christina said, uh, you know, Delaware is a lowest lying state. Uh, you've heard this multiple times. And so we are relatively flat as well. So we are a coastal state. And uh, this is something that, um, that the, the state of Delaware has to contend with uh, over the next several decades. In fact, uh, not even several decades, but now. So um, uh, what exactly is the challenge? Thank you, Salim. What exactly is the challenge? Um, uh, the challenge is sea level rise and uh, some modeling. I saw that John Callahan is on this call right now and he is the one who actually put together this graph. So maybe he should jump on and explain it. Uh, he'd do a better job than I can, but these are the most recent projections for sea level rise in Delaware. Um, the red line, the high line there, is if we essentially maintain uh, our high emission scenario. Um, the green line is a moderate scenario and the blue line is a low um, emission scenario. So you can see even with a low emission scenario, uh, by the end of the century we are looking at at least a half a meter, so about a foot and a half, um, excuse me, about a, um, yeah, a foot and a half of sea level rise by the end of this century. So um, uh, 
my understanding is that currently we are on the high emission scenario um, that, that we will, unless we significantly decarbonize and do many of the things that the previous presenters talked about and more, uh, in addition, transportation, we haven't even really mentioned transportation, which accounts for approximately 40% of, of Delaware's, the nation's, and, and global emissions. Um, we are not going to get to that low emission scenario. So um, this is something that um, we need to be prepared for and we need to start preparing for. So next slide, please. Uh, one of the other things that happened in 2017 was modeling about what the impact of sea level rise will be. So these are maps that are publicly available. You can go to uh, first map, uh, which is Delaware's um, uh, GIS uh, service, and you can play around with these maps. They are available online, um, and they model sea level rise and invasion up uh, on, in increments of one foot up to seven feet. So anybody who's got a good geography, uh, knowledge of geography in Delaware will recognize this location as South Bethany. Um, the orange layers there uh, is, is a three foot sea level rise. So this is what we are looking at by the end of the century um, at a low emission scenario. So three feet, and you can see there in South Bethany, those canals um, on the back bay side and the marsh side, um, most of those homes will be permanently inundated. Now, something that I have to acknowledge here is that these models do not account for precipitation. So this is only um, permanent inundation from uh, a rise in sea level. We know, unfortunately, that Delaware floods currently without even um, a three feet of sea level rise because the, the, all of the development that has happened, runoff, flatness of the land, in addition to um, our proximity to these um, tidal water bodies. And so we already experienced flooding. In fact, there was a, um, and when you add flooding, when you add precipitation events onto the sea level rise, these maps look even more concerning. Uh, some analyses that have been done, um, one of the issues with climate change impacts is the frequency and intensity of um, heavy precipitation events that we will have here in the state. And by the end of the century, um, that one in a hundred year flood, uh, which happens one in a hundred years now, is going to happen basically every year. It will be an annual flood by the end of the century when we account for the enhanced precipitation and the sea level. So this is something that we have to do. So, Moving forward, next slide, please. What can we do? So there are things that we can do, and um, here is a typology with, um, uh, of different sea level rise adaptation strategies. So what can municipalities and states do to deal with this threat? Um, there's essentially four different um, four different strategies that can be pursued uh, depending on context and depending on resources and and whatnot you can pursue different strategies. So the first strategy is protect. So this is something that basically we hard engineer um, uh, shoreline or some type of uh, public works project to prevent flooding and damage from sea level rise. Another uh, strategy is to accommodate. So these are things that we can do um, to our existing assets that allow them to be inundated uh, but reduce their vulnerability and, um, and damage to sea level impacts. The third strategy is avoiding. So if we have areas that are currently undeveloped, uh, we don't have to develop them. We can actually avoid placing critical infrastructure properties in uh, vulnerable areas. And finally, the fourth and perhaps the most hardest, as you go down in these, uh, as you go down the page here, strategies get progressively more difficult to achieve. Um, the fourth and final strategy is retreat. So this is a situation where you have assets adjacent to um, the sea, they are under threat, and you essentially relocate and just get out of the way and let nature take its course. So these are the different strategies, and thankfully we've pursued um, all four of these to, to greater or lesser extent here in Delaware. So this is Newcastle. Uh, our protect strategy, where we're essentially hard engineering. This is maybe one of the first public works projects, um, European European led public works projects in the in, in the state of Delaware. Right, the Dutch arrived, and uh, as the Dutch are wont to do, they started building pipes. So in the mid 17th century, in uh, in Newcastle, uh, these dikes were built. 
um, and they're still there and they're still performing their function um, um, uh, for the city of Newcastle. Next slide. Uh, another thing that we are doing currently in Delaware is beach replenishment. So um, you're all familiar with this practice. If you if you are from the state, right? What we do is we take uh, uh, sand, uh, dredge it from offshore, and we pump it onshore. So we we replenish our dunes, we build our dunes back up, um, we extend the beaches out into the into the water. I'm not um, I'm not passing judgment on the um, on the effectiveness or the efficiency or the um, cost effectiveness of any of these policies, I'm simply um, highlighting, I know some of these things are controversial, I'm simply highlighting uh, strategies that we have undertaken here in Delaware. Uh, next slide, so accommodate. So how do we deal with um, some of our existing assets and how do we accommodate uh, sea level rise impacts? One of the most prominent ways to do that um, at the local level is through what's called a free board. And that is in your local floodplain ordinance. So if you have floodplains in your municipality, all municipalities are required to have a floodplain ordinance. And in that ordinance, it defines uh, what's called free board. And this is a dimension above the, uh, the maximum flood height for a one in a hundred, the flood height for a one in a hundred year storm at which you are able to build your ground level. So if your flood is, um, if your flood level is here in the floodplain and your freeboard is six inches, that means you can build your, you must build your lowest ground floor six inches above your, your flood level. So this is like a safety factor that um, municipalities identify within their floodplain ordinances. So if the flood is worse than the hundred year, your, your, um, your home is not completely inundated. These uh, dimensions vary across the state. There are some municipalities that have zero freeboard, meaning you are allowed to build um, a new construction right at the base flood level, uh, up to, for example, two feet. So in some, in some municipalities, I was talking with the, um, the city planner of Ocean View earlier today on the phone, and their freeboard um, is two feet in Ocean View, which is, very, which is a very good number. Next slide. Um, another system of accommodation um, we could identify as South Wilmington's Wetland Park. So this is an uh, area that frequently floods. Um, it actually uh, might, maybe this would be better for the avoid uh, uh, category of the typology, but essentially um, the, the South Wilmington's Wetland Park, Wetlands Park is um, an area in South Wilmington where um, the, the flood, flood um, uh, runoff from South Wilmington flows into this area. It also accommodates um, sea level rise, and this will be a okay. Um, uh, this will be an amenity for the South Wilmington area. Next slide. Uh, we have a similar park in, in Laurel. So on the Broad Creek um, in Laurel, it's actually called Tidewater Park. And this is an area, um, uh, this is looking from the creek into Laurel. If I turned around, you would see uh, you would see Broad Creek. Uh, it's a tidal. It's a tidal creek in in Laurel in southwestern Delaware, and uh, this is an area that's remained undeveloped. And they're putting a playground there. So this is a low impact development. So if it gets inundated, you're not damaging um, um, critical infrastructure or community assets. Uh, the avoid situation. Um, I can I can highlight Bethany Beach here. Bethany Beach purchased um, a. 12-acre parcel, I believe, um, to turn it into the Bethany Beach Nature Center. So this was a wetlands area um, within, the, within the municipal boundaries of Bethany Beach. And they saw that um, development um, of this area would be uh, damaged a sensitive, ecologically sensitive area. And they thought, let's also provide an amenity for residents and visitors. So they went, and they went ahead and purchased the property um, and turn it into a nature center, therefore avoiding any development on this, uh, on this parcel. Next slide. Um, the retreat option, uh, I've only got one really good example here. This is in Bowers Beach where there was a chronically flooded property 
and the state worked with um, DEMA, so Delaware Emergency Management Agency, and FEMA, which funded a buyout of the property. The property owners um, sold it to the municipality um, with funding from FEMA. And the, the municipality turned it into, again, they turned it when, uh, as a part of uh, the stipulations for this program, if you get bought out, you cannot redevelop the property. And so um, the municipality effectively turned it into a bocce court for, for the community. Um, these are all ad hoc measures that sort of happen around the state. Um, uh, here and there, DEMA might get involved, DENREC might get involved, the local municipalities might get involved. So there's a lot of, it's sort of a patchwork effort. Unfortunately uh, for Delaware, we do not have a, a state-led, and I mean from uh, the administrative side of the state, um, we do not have a state-led coordinated sea level rise adaptation plan. Uh, this is something that DENREC has talked about doing. I know DENREC is currently involved in developing a climate mitigation plan for the state, and there is conversation about developing an adaptation plan to go along with it, but right now we do not have in the state of Delaware, a statewide sea level rise adaptation plan. We have vulnerability assessments and we sort of know what's going on, but we don't have a coordinated effort. And so stepping into that void um, uh, is a group that's called RASCAL. Some of you on the call might be familiar with this. Uh, this is the Resilient and Sustainable Communities League. Uh, this was started five years ago uh, by myself and um, uh, Susan Love, Mike Bullstrip, Who's on the call? I saw uh, Kelly Valencic and Daniel Swallow, and um, the, the group of us got together to try to talk to um, and coordinate our efforts with state partners. And I, I just pulled up the the agenda, um, the, the agenda for our first meeting uh, back in August 13th, 2015. And before it was called RASCAL, which is Resilient and Sustainable Communities League, which is essentially a grouping of state agencies that are working on this um, issue, state partners, so Office of State Planning Coordination, D Grant, uh, various divisions within DENRAC, Institute for Public Administration, um, Bayshore, some nonprofits, we're all sort of coordinating our efforts to assist local government uh, to, to become more resilient and sustainable. We came up with, with this acronym, Resilient and Sustainable Communities League, and I'm looking at our, um, our very first agenda for our very first meeting back in August 13, 2015. Uh, we called ourselves Delaware's Climate Change Resiliency and Sustainable Community Partner Planning Coordination Meeting, which is a mouthful. Um, we are now called RASCAL. Um, so it rolls off the tongue a little bit better. So this is something that actually has received some recognition around the country as being a um, sort of a model to emulate that um, in the absence of coordinated uh, top-down management that the various agencies and the partners around the state that assist and provide technical assistance, financial assistance, and resources to local governments actually coordinate their own efforts to ensure that they're not duplicating and, um, and um, uh, that they're being effective and, and how they reach out to the local leaders. So um, that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Phil. Um, clearly, um, just one second. We've have we got everyone back on uh, regular Zoom? Okay, wonderful. So uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, Phil has been an innovator at the community level with the establishment of RASCAL, that could be one of the, the innovations that we highlight. Um, we've been asked to highlight three innovations or solutions that Delaware can present to the rest of the country and to the world. Uh, community solar, I think, was another one that was noted and the work that Dr. Byrne did with the state initially to try and develop a utility interface uh, with the solar uh, power sector would perhaps be one. I'm just seeding these ideas as we open up for conversation. Uh, and then um, on the wind power side, uh, V2G uh, may be another one, which is a Delaware-based innovation. I'm not sure how much of it is being actually done in Delaware, because I know the company is in Denmark and they're doing work in Europe, uh, but that may be something we can discuss. So we have about 20 minutes for 
uh, discussion. Uh, given the number of people who are online, uh, I have muted everyone. I was trying to not do the, the gag on my end, but I had to because we were getting some background noise. But I can unmute anyone who would like to chat. There is a feature in Zoom which allows you to raise your hand. Um, and uh, or if you don't know how to do that, you can just type and say, I want to ask a question on the air. Or you can type your question uh, on uh, the chat feature and we can ask that at the plenary level. So I'm going to unmute our panelists uh, and uh, then um, open it up for a conversation uh, therein. Uh, I should also note that the Dean of the College of Earth, Ocean and Environment, uh, Dr. Estella Atikwana is also on uh, the call. And um, to uh, thank her for uh, her participation, I wanted to also give her a chance if she had any particular question or comment up front uh, to, to say so as well. So uh, if Dr. Atakwana would like to ask a question or make a comment, we'd be delighted, but I'm also unmuting the other panelists. Uh, hi, uh, Salim, and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Usually you have to be very careful if you're a dean and you show up in a place like this, yeah. then they ask you to say something, <laughs> which I wasn't really planning on saying anything, but um, I'm really impressed with the uh, climate uh, research efforts that are going on on our campus. And sometimes um, from where I sit, it's difficult to see all of these things. And so I really wanted to join this panel, your panelists today to learn more about what uh, UD has been doing and the state of Delaware has been doing. And as you know, Climate change is one of the initiatives that uh, is being highlighted in our new strategic plan. So if you get a chance, please go to the college website and the plan is brand new. And we do have a climate initiative that we will be launching this year. And many of you on this uh, platform right now are, are, have volunteered to participate, to help uh, am, amplify the climate research that is being done, you know, at the University of Delaware. And I just want to say thank you to all the presenters today. It was really great hearing from all of you, and uh, I really enjoyed learning a whole lot about the climate initiatives that is that's going on on our campus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Atakwana. Um, all right, so uh, we are open for questions and conversations. Uh, we have some uh, points which are being raised in the uh, uh, chat room. Uh, I have unmuted all of our panelists also, if they would like to make any comments themselves uh, as well. So um, I think Catherine said she wanted to ask a question. Uh, I can unmute Catherine if she'd like to ask a question. Hello. Catherine? Um, hi, uh, everybody. I just wanted to know where is the raise your hand button? Ah yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's in the in the participant list. If you go to the participant list, and there's a way to raise your hand at the bottom. There's a, a little hand which should show up there. Um, but since you have the floor, you're welcome to ask a question. Okay, and then um, that's fine. I'm not seeing that, but I'll look for that later. I wanted to ask really, really early on in the in the talk about how there's a very big difference between how, what people who are, first of all, I'm not a scientist, so I'm just very interested. Um, why people who are poor pay more for um, energy than people who are rich. So Dr. Byrne, yeah. this may be for you to address, given you gave yeah. the climate. When we're yeah. talking about social justice, I, I don't understand that, so I, I yes. start, yeah. No, I, I, I saw your question. I tried to on chat, so uh, you know, <laughs> I tried to answer on chat as well, but that's, that's another whole, uh, but anyway, the, the, um, uh, the graph is intended to show you um, what is the income effort that a family needs to make in order to pay for the basic services, uh, basic electricity services needed in the home. And basic electricity services are normally defined as something in the vicinity of, of uh, uh, around 1,000 kilowatt hours or 800 kilowatt hours per month. 
and you then take the price that everyone pays uh, for that electricity, multiply it by that basic uh, electricity uh, need for a household uh, today, and then you're going to divide it by the income of the household. Gotcha, gotcha, and gotcha. Yeah, got so it's yeah. Really, yeah, based on income versus that it costs that's, a poor person. That's correct. It's not the price that changes; it's the uh, yeah, the amount of effort that a family needs to make just to have um, basic services. So. Uh, yes, I, yes. Uh, we have another follow-up question around the acronyms, the N-E-M-E-R-S. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, yeah. I apparently went too fast on some of this, and I'm, I'm really sorry about that. So uh, the major uh, innovations of uh, the um, uh, states and localities in the U.S. are N-E-M, net, net electricity metering, which means this applies to wind, it applies to solar. Um, if you um, participate in a program that builds uh, that technology, um, you will then be, um, in terms of your bill, your bill will fall by an amount equal to what you pay for that electricity normally from the grid. That parity creates the conditions for uh, folks to actually use uh, the electricity to lower their solar electricity or wind electricity to lower um, their bills. And uh, uh, in the, in the um, slide that uh, Joe showed uh, on Wilmington and on Newark, if um, you were to build, for example, a pool that would take the public buildings, we've been in discussion with the city of Wilmington uh, and with the city of Newark about using their own public buildings as the hosts for uh, this sort of uh, uh, approach, so-called so solar cities approach, they would then actually see their bills go down because they would be offset um, uh, by that amount of electricity that uh, was being generated by the system. They would in turn pay a developer a price that currently is about three cents per kilowatt hour less. So you don't need to be a scientist. What it basically is is if you go today into these new approaches, you actually will pay less for electricity than if you stay uh, on the grid. And uh, those opportunities are why solar cities wow. are becoming very powerful, very popular uh, around the world. The additional, uh, just very quickly, RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard, the state sets a schedule of what percentage that the utility must acquire from uh, its customers for uh, different renewable energy sources. And that requirement is backed up by uh, uh, a, a uh, market called the renewable energy credits market where the utility offers uh, um, a payment for those uh, renewable energy um, uh, consumption that would come uh, through that new program. And uh, those renewable energy credits currently uh, provide about an annual uh, investment in uh, solar of about six to seven million dollars a year and currently for wind at about three and a half to $5 million a year. So um, that's what the RPS is. And uh, it's been a very important uh, second uh, uh, major driver in moving us toward a, um, um, what Phil said is uh, at least from a mitigation standpoint, reducing the CO2 that we put into the atmosphere. The third, uh, was uh, um, an energy efficiency resource standard, EERS. Uh, energy efficiency resource standard basically requires the utilities to reduce the amount of electricity they, um, they sell. Uh, and the way to do that is to buy through energy efficiency and renewable energy to buy down the amount of grid electricity that needs to be provided. Uh, again, that approach uh, helps us to accelerate the development of these sustainable energy options. And the last one, uh, and I'm really sorry, I didn't even mention it in my uh, talk, uh, Public Benefits Fund used to be, it's not so frequently used any longer, it was a subsidy. It was a subsidy that came out of state government that paid uh, like a down payment for you to, to buy, to begin to make an investment in, in solar energy for it. Uh, okay. Wonderful. Energy. 
So thank you so much. Now there are lots of other questions which are coming up in the chat feature. Uh, please, uh, the panelists, go to the chat feature to try and address some of them. Uh, I, for the remaining 10 minutes, I also wanted to note um, that we have members from uh, the state government also part of uh, the audience. If they have any points they would like to make, uh, and also the last 10 minutes I would like to spend on getting consensus on these three uh, key innovations. I mentioned some, but if there are others that the uh, participants would like to bring up, um, you have an opportunity to do so. Uh, you can type them in the chat room. I have also, again, given an opportunity for people to unmute if they want to and speak up. Um, but uh, please, uh, you know, be careful that there's not too much background noise. All right. So anyone from the state government who may be on the call who would like to comment or say anything regarding innovations? Okay, all right, well, no worries. Um, so we have a few other uh, points which have been raised as well uh, in the chat feature. Uh, there's, there's a lot uh, being asked around uh, turbines and other questions. So any of the other panelists, if you would like to comment or highlight uh, some of the discussion in, from the chat or other innovations which you think we may have missed. Joe, did you want to say something as well? Thought I saw Joe. Uh, I think regarding B2G in Delaware, I can send you some links later to, um, and also okay. I'm sure Dr. Kempton can as well, because uh, he had a uh, little test facility on the Star Campus, uh, where there were something like 10 uh, vehicles that were connected to the grid and acting as a power plant. So they were testing the idea of B2G at a, um, you know, pretty, la pre pretty large scale, meaning that they were providing ancillary services to PJM, and they were being they were they were basically acting like a power plant. So it's a very cool, um, very cool application that was done here at UD. Okay. So I That's think great. it would be worth, uh, yeah, it would be worth mentioning it in as one of the three innovations. Wonderful. We also had a point made by Beth. Uh, uh, regarding any pending legislations in Delaware. Uh, she has noted one uh, that has been pending and is asking whether that will pass or not given the COVID crisis, the RPS community solar bill. Uh, are there other Delaware legislations which are pending currently that we should bring up in this conversation? JB, um, or sure. Phil, particularly Phil is very active also on this, either of you. I, I'd be happy on the ARP, on uh, Beth Chages' question. Um, and Phil, if he would like to say something, go right ahead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, Beth Chages uh, uh, identifies a serious problem that we're going to face this spring, uh, which is how is the legislature gonna function? And uh, uh, that's not a small problem. Um, what I would say is that uh, uh, both of these uh, elements are combined in a single bill, the RPS Community Solar Bill. Um, it is something that needs to be vetted with the wider community. Um, I know that there is a very strong interest by many legislators to see this happen. And so I'm, I'm uh, personally, but I have no crystal ball and all of this that's worth much, but I, I'm personally hopeful that uh, uh, this uh, new approach will uh, be acted upon by the legislature. My understanding is the way the legislature is going to uh, focus on this issue is that there are going to be elements that are gonna be folded into a bill that is multiple bills in order to reduce the amount of, uh, of uh, individual bill voting that's needed. And uh, of course, citizens can comment on anything they want and uh, they may or may not survive in that, that pooling, but that is one technique that's being considered. Okay. Uh, so uh, we are, again, we'll, let me mute everyone again, we're getting feedback. <laughs> okay, uh, we need to wrap up now, but before we do, I wanted to alert 
uh, everyone to the fact that the goal of this Power Dog uh, dialogue is to make sure educators in high school and college can use this for their teaching purposes and to galvanize interest from students as well. So a parting thought from each of our panelists, if you would have any thoughts for students, uh, we do have many students in the audience as well. Uh, we've had interest from public schools as well as charter schools, private schools like St. Andrews, uh, who have uh, said that they will uh, be uh, using some of this material. So what kind of uh, advice would you have for students to get engaged in climate uh, policy related work? Um, of course, there is work they can do themselves. So I'll just give you a lightning round, a minute or two each to the panelists to give some wise words to the students. So let's start off uh, with um, uh, Christina, perhaps. Since you you have uh, your own children in high school and college as well. <laughs> um, oh, that's that's tough. Um, I think we need to be optimistic and, and more positive. I mean, it, it's obviously a very tough uh, fight against climate change. It's one of the most difficult challenges that that we have, but it's also a wonderful opportunity. It really is. We have the technology. We have experts. Uh, we have the knowledge, we have the connectivity. Sometimes it's just, you know, politics, it's, you know, perceptions, um, but we can do it. We can do it. So let's stay positive and, uh, you know, take that CO2 down. <laughs> yes, definitely. Bend the curve. <laughs> yes. um, Joe, any thoughts from you? On yeah, I'll just, food? yeah. I would just like to say that uh, while climate change has received uh, much attention and rightly so, and uh, that has made it a source of much controversy, uh, but also because the, imp the impact is so severe because it affects nearly all the sectors of the economy, but more so asset intensive industry. Yet the, while this debate uh, continues about how uh, to best understand and manage our systems or in terms of the, the changing climate, scientists do agree that it, it does have an impact. And that's a message that most students and all students indeed should uh, uh, understand in terms of how, you know, when they are making choices or in their careers, they should be able to understand that some of the industries and careers that they choose to pursue in the future are going to be affected by this issue of climate change. Great, thank you, Joe. Phil, over to you. Uh, so the first thing you could do is vote. That's what, <laughs> that's what, that's what Evan said in the introductory video, right? Yes. Um, uh, vote and make this an issue. Mm -hmm. Two, if you don't like your options when you're out voting, run for office or volunteer in your community, um, get yourself on a, a local council. They're always looking for, for volunteers. And three, um, if, if that doesn't work, um, actually these are not mutually exclusive, then go ahead, like when Greta Thunberg organizes the next student strike, leave your classes and tell your teachers and your parents why you're doing it. So um, my, my advice to the students is to get politically active. Wonderful. And last but not least, JB, what advice are you giving your grandkids and, <laughs> and others? So I would, I would encourage uh, that folks get involved and active, just as Phil was indicating. I'll offer a couple of practical strategies uh, uh, that include internships. We've had an internship program that we've run for a long time in the center. I know that um, many of the university, the school of public, uh, the Biden School, uh, does a lot of that too. It's open not only for uh, university students, but also for uh, high school students. But I think getting involved, for example, as even recommended, getting involved in the legislature and finding out uh, how exactly these things are done. It's, I, I can assure you it's not easy, but it's also not difficult to uh, get yourself placed uh, in that way. And if anyone wants to try, I'm sure all of the members of the panel, but certainly Joe and I, if you'll just email us, we'll try and we'll try and help you uh, with the kind of things that you want to get involved with. 
Excellent. And so, well, thanks to all of the panelists for the audience. I'll conclude with a quotation from one of my favorite novelists, George Eliot, uh, who wrote in her novel Middlemarch that the growing good of the world is largely made up of unhistoric acts. So much mm -hmm. as we are looking for big historic conferences and conventions, much of the good that comes in the world is from those very uh, small incremental efforts made for by each one of us. So thanks to everyone. Please keep uh, connected, uh, share the news of this session. Uh, the video will be available within the next week on the Bard College website. They have them for each state. You can also view videos from other states and you can compare, especially our neighboring states. Pennsylvania, uh, Penn State University hosted Pennsylvania session. So you can view Penn State's uh, session. You can view Maryland session. Um, New Jersey, others. So definitely, uh, you know, let's share the joy between the states. Also, some of the other international uh, sessions which were held in Bangladesh and Brazil uh, and elsewhere. So uh, let's keep the momentum. This will be an annual event. Bard College hopes to do this next year as well. So uh, stay connected and hopefully we'll have some good news with uh, Delaware's climate plan being implemented, a new uh, adaptation plan perhaps in in uh, preparation, as Dr. Barnes suggested, and uh, other happy occurrings and beyond this current crisis. So thanks, everyone, and let's keep in touch. Bye-bye. Thank you, Salim. Bye. <laughs>